Our classroom stock portfolio had a great week and now has an annual return of 21.78%. The portfolio has broken the $2,000 level and is now worth $2,039.83 after 123 weeks. Hi, Professor Rex here. We're now a little over two years into our class project where we invest a total of only $12.50 per week and split it up to buy 10 different dividend paying stocks. If you're new to my channel, I teach college accounting and I often show my students how to use the accounting concepts that I teach to pick stocks because it grabs the attention of my students and gets them engaged. To show them the accounting concepts in action, starting a little over two years ago, each Monday, I invest actual real world money, $12.50 per week, which is roughly the equivalent of $50 each month, into 10 different dividend paying stocks. And because those original students are no longer in my class, I decided to make this video series to let them know how our portfolio is doing. There are timestamp links in the description of the video in case you want to just jump to the list of stocks we bought this week or the list of our best performers or any other section of the video. In 2022, the year we started the portfolio, the market did not perform well. But because I don't believe in trying to time the market, we kept buying each week at what turned out to be great prices. Then in 2023, stocks took off. Currently, the portfolio's value is over $2,039, and the return has been 21.78% per year, which is higher than the S&P 500. Last year, the portfolio's return was 28.6%, which also beat the S&P 500. And in the preceding year, the portfolio once again beat the market. So why do we only invest in dividend paying stocks in this portfolio? That's explained on the next slide. The first reason we stick with dividend paying stocks is, according to a Hartford study, over the past 50 years, dividend paying stocks vastly outperform non-dividend paying stocks. The total return for dividend paying stocks has been 9.17% per year, but for non-dividend paying stocks, average return has been much lower at 4.27%. The study is updated each year and was recently updated to include last year. So go check out the source link that I include at the bottom of this slide. Maybe more importantly, Historically, dividend paying stocks have less volatility than non-dividend paying stocks. It's much easier to stick with a less volatile investing strategy. The more volatile a strategy is, the more likely you are to panic and sell at the wrong time. So why are dividend paying stocks less volatile? Because most dividend paying companies are making a profit, which is why they have excess cash to pay back to investors. As you can see on the screen, risk and volatility of dividend paying stocks as measured by beta and standard deviation tend to be much lower for dividend paying stocks, which is a good thing. And finally, the study also showed that the best performing stocks are dividend paying stocks that increase their dividends, which is why our classroom portfolio only invests in dividend paying stocks that have increased their dividend recently. So why did we choose to invest $12.50 per week, which is essentially the same as $25 per paycheck? The next slide explains that. The main reason why we invest only $12.50 per week into the portfolio is because I wanted to show my accounting students that you don't need much money to build a diversified stock portfolio. In fact, when I was only making $11,000 per year as an enlisted member of the military, I started my investing journey with only $25 per paycheck, in other words, the equivalent of $12.50 per week. And because my brokerage account, Fidelity, allows me to buy as little as $1 per stock, we can quickly and easily create a diversified stock portfolio with little money. Originally, I invested $12, or excuse me, $25 per paycheck into this portfolio, but found the process to be so fun that I split it up and now invest $12.50 every week. And we boost the contribution once per year by the amount of inflation to replicate the fact that people's paychecks usually increase by at least by the amount of inflation. By the way, I also invest in these same stocks in my retirement portfolio and my taxable brokerage account. The research we discuss in class is the same research I use for myself. Another reason I started with a low investment amount was because one day I was wondering how much a young person, in this case a 17 year old, needed to invest per week to accumulate $1 million at retirement. And it turns out it's only $11.74 per week. Of course, since most people's annual salary increases each year by the amount of inflation at the very least, I assumed the contributions would increase by 3% each year, which is around the historical rate of inflation. That means in the second year, it's assumed that the person invested in an additional 35 cents each week 
for a total of $12.09 per week instead of $11.74. And for our classroom stock portfolio in year two, we boosted the weekly investment 82 cents for a total of $13.32 per week. And in year three, inflation wasn't quite as high, so we boosted the weekly investment by only 49 cents for a total of $13.81 per week. A very popular exchange traded fund that only holds dividend paying stocks is the Schwab US Dividend Equity ETF, better known as ticker SCHD. SCHD is a large holding in my personal account, so I've been tracking SCHD's performance closely with our classroom stock portfolio. As of today, the classroom stock portfolio's value is $2,039.83. If we had instead invested the same exact amounts into the ETF called SCHD on the same days, the portfolio's value would only be $1,750.59, a difference of 16.5%. Obviously, there's no guarantee their portfolio will keep outperforming SCHD at such a high rate, but I've been gradually selling off my personal SCHD holdings and reinvesting in our classroom stock portfolio's basket of stocks. I also prefer our actively managed classroom stock portfolio strategy rather than SCHD's purely algorithmic approach where no one is overseeing the stock selection. SCHD has at times had large positions in stocks that I consider to be value traps, and that's not a good thing. This slide shows our best performing stocks based on when they were initially purchased. Stocks in yellow have been sold. Lamb Research is at the top and has provided us a total return of 143.8% in 19 and a half months. Lamb Research makes equipment that other companies use to make advanced microchips used in phones, computers, cars, etc. New to the list this week is auto parts provider Finia, which replaces Microsoft at number 15. Finia has provided a total return of 56.5% in 8.3 months. And remember that total return includes both the dividends the company has paid as well as the increase in the stock price. Now let's turn our attention to the strategy column, specifically the category called dividend growth stocks. 90% of our investments made in this portfolio were made in these stocks, which means they are high quality stocks with a great track record of increasing their dividend payouts to investors. The other 10% of investments so far have been invested in usually smaller under the radar companies that have recently started paying a dividend. These under the radar dividend paying stocks tend to be riskier because they are usually smaller companies, but studies have shown they historically beat the market averages by a significant amount. This slide shows our best performing stocks this week, ranging from nearly 5% to 9.2%. Best performers this week were Agilent Technologies at 7.4%, American Express at 5%, FMC Corp at 9.2%, Ingredient at 5%, ITT Corp at 7.5%, Canview at 7%, McKesson at 5.8%, Moody's at 5.2%, Morgan Stanley at 5%, Nextera Energy at 5.2%, and Finia at 6.3%. Before we look at the 10 stocks we bought this week, here are the 10 stocks we bought a year ago, along with their total returns, which of course includes dividends. I still own all the stocks except the stocks in yellow. I sold Williams Sonoma because it appeared to be because it appeared to be fairly valued at the time, but so far it seems I sold it too soon because the stock continues to go up. I sold Robert Half to generate additional funds to invest in other companies, and the companies seem to be closely or close to fairly valued at the time. And I sold Fidelity National Info Services because it cut the dividend, but it still provided a positive return of 26.1%. The average return of the 10 stocks I bought a year ago is 49% despite three stocks not being held the full year. The annualized return for all 10 stocks is 53.9%. Obviously our purchases won't continue that high rate of return, but it's a great start for this portfolio. Remember, stocks historically average a 10% return per year. Now 90% of our portfolio is comprised of high quality dividend growth stocks, but the other 10% is invested in under the radar dividend pairs, companies that are usually smaller, but have recently started paying dividends. They tend, because they're smaller, they tend to be very volatile and very risky. No one should be purchasing those small companies um, 
until they've done their due diligence. They are not for the faint of heart. Now, like I said, most of these under the radar dividend payers are very small companies without many analysts following them. But lately, giant tech companies like Google have been jumping on the dividend trend and deciding to start paying dividends for the first time in company history. So this week, we bought two under the radar dividend payers that both have to be giant tech companies. Here's a screenshot of the first one from Yahoo Finance. The company is called Salesforce, and they recently announced the company will pay their very first dividend this year. Salesforce provides the software that businesses use to keep track of customer interaction and sales data. It's a very famous tech company. The other giant tech company that we bought this week that started paying its first dividend is Meta Platforms, famous for Facebook and Instagram. Now, I doubt that neither Salesforce Force nor Meta Platforms will increase their dividends substantially in the future like some of our more mature companies have been doing like Visa and MasterCard, but you can never tell for sure. Now let's talk about the other dividend paying stocks we bought this week. Here are my ratings for the top 13 dividend paying stocks this past week. They are Comcast, Visa, MasterCard, Thermo Fisher, American Express, Microsoft, Allegiant, Masco, Nike, Bank of New York Mellon, Interpublic, Ameriprise, and Gilead. We purchased the 10 stocks that are not in the yellow highlight. The stocks in yellow have already grown to be 4% or more of their portfolio, so we did not invest more in them this week because we want to build a more diversified, less risky portfolio. Remember, each week we buy 10 stocks. And since we're investing in such a small amount each week, it means we're buying fractional shares in our brokerage account. This table includes their industry, how undervalued they are according to our research, their risk rating, quality grade, and dividend yield. The three most undervalued stocks this week seem to be Comcast, Allegiant, and Gilead Sciences. Remember, all these stocks pay a dividend have recently increased their dividends, and our methodology used here indicates that they are likely to continue to raise dividends. Therefore, this is a dividend growth strategy for the stocks on this slide. On this slide, I want to show the components to our quality grade. Quality-wise, we only invest in stocks rated B- minus or better for this portfolio for 90% of our purchases. The other 10% of our purchases so far have been invested in those smaller under-the-radar companies that have recently started paying a dividend. Those under-the-radar dividend-paying stocks tend to be riskier because they usually are smaller companies. But studies have shown that they historically beat the market averages by a significant amount. All the stocks we bought this week from this slide qualified as high quality and are dividend growth stocks. The other two under the radar dividend payers that we bought, Salesforce and Meta Platforms on the previous slides, are also high quality companies, but it's too soon to tell if they will become dividend growth stocks, which would mean that they will, ha will would eventually have a long history of raising their dividends that they pay to their shareholders. Risk is the first quality component on this slide, which we mentioned on the previous slide. The next quality component is competitive advantage. Obviously, the more competitive advantages a company has, the better investment candidate they are. The next quality component attempts to evaluate the company's management. Our evaluation includes both management's use of capital and general decision making, but also our research dives deep into accounting data to look for red flags in the company's accounting practices, as well as the quality or reliability of their reported earnings. And reporting earnings is just a fancy way of saying profits. And finally, the last quality component is financial health. Now, if you're looking for lower risk stocks, I would suggest American Express, Microsoft, and Nike. Remember that the risk rating is comparing these stocks to other stocks, not to other investments like bonds or CDs. The companies earning the highest financial health rating this week are Visa, MasterCard, Thermo Fisher, and Microsoft. Remember, historically, the best performing stocks are those that both pay a dividend and have grown their dividend recently. As you can see under the grade called Grade for Recent Dividend Growth and Current Yield, the stocks with the best combination of dividend growth and a higher yield are Interpublic, which has an a rating, followed by Comcast, Visa, MasterCard, Allegiant, Nike, and Bank of New York Mellon. Ideally, you want a higher dividend, high recent dividend growth, and the best potential for future dividend growth, but that's not the way it works. 
Companies that are already paying out higher dividends rarely have the greatest potential for the greatest growth in those dividends. And our list, as you can see from the last grade called dividend growth potential, the companies in the best position to increase their dividends substantially are MasterCard, Thermo Fisher, American Express, and Ameriprise. The companies with the best combination of recent dividend increases and potential of future dividend increases are Comcast, Visa, MasterCard, Thermo Fisher, and American Express. The holy grail of investing in dividend paying stocks is to have the portfolio generate enough dividends to cover your annual expenses, a level I've reached despite being on a teacher salary. Historically, dividend paying companies raise their dividends by 5 to 6%, which is above the historical rate of inflation. This means a stock portfolio can provide the ultimate passive income stream, that being one that increases each year above the rate of inflation. On this slide, we're looking at stocks in our portfolio that have raised their dividends recently. On top of last week's two dividend increases, two more of our stocks this week announced they're increasing the dividends again, and they are Carrot Packaging and Clear Secure, raising their dividends 16.7% and 11.1% respectively. Now, this is the second consecutive quarter in which Carrot Packaging increased their dividend. In February, they raised their dividend a whopping 50%. The company now pays a 4.85% dividend yield. Ideally, we want our companies to raise their dividends higher than 3%, which is a historical average, of, uh, historical average rate of inflation. The announced dividend increases this week average 13.9%, and the average dividend increase on this slide is 11.2%. Very nice indeed. Here's a look at the 10 stocks that make up the largest position, or the largest portion of the portfolio as of Sunday. Charles Schwab is still the largest holding at 4.3%, followed by American Express, Microsoft, Visa, and then Allegiant. New to the top 10 is Nextera Energy, an electric utility paying a 2.8% dividend yield. Remember, our goal is to build a conservative and diversified portfolio by limiting the amount we invest into one single company. Aggressive investors might want to limit the investment or excuse me, aggressive investors might not want to limit the investment into any one stock. But I'm a conservative investor. Therefore, we temporarily stop investing in a company if they make up more than 4% of our portfolio. This leads to a less risky, more diversified portfolio. It's true that our portfolio's returns would likely be higher if we always invested in our top 10 stocks, regardless of the size of the stock's portfolio allocation. That also creates a more concentrated and more volatile portfolio, and many investors can't psychologically stick with a volatile portfolio. A lot of new investors don't understand that until they experience the volatility. Volatility often causes investors to panic and sell at the worst time possible. Our portfolio holdings are now at 93. That might seem like a large number of companies to keep track of, but the spreadsheet we have developed for tracking the companies make it obvious when to sell a company once we download company financial and accounting information into the spreadsheet, which we do at least weekly and doesn't take that much time. YouTube viewers have asked for more details about the technology stock portfolio that we created, so I have this slide. Because my students love technology stocks, on January 1st of this year, I funded a Fidelity account with $1,000 and we invested into only stocks offering products or services involved with certain technology themes. Unlike our other portfolios, we are not investing additional funds each week into this portfolio. We are sticking with the original $1,000 investment. The tech themes we built the portfolio around so far are artificial intelligence, cloud computing, software as a service, cybersecurity, and big data. So far, the portfolio has increased 11.36% in less than five months. In comparison, technology ETF with the ticker XLK is up 6.5% over the same time period. Best performers are NVIDIA at 86.7%, Peer Storage 55.6%, Meta Platforms at 38.5%, CrowdStrike Holdings at 30.6%, and SAP at 26.7%. As mentioned before, many of my students are extremely interested in tech stocks and have requested that we rank them separately each week, even if they don't pay a dividend. The $1,000 tech portfolio shown on the previous slide is based on certain technology themes and therefore includes some stocks that aren't technically in the technology sector, companies like Google and Amazon. So on this slide, I rate the top stocks for the week, but they must be in the technology sector. Note that these are 
note that all these stocks are high qual quality, meaning they must have a quality ranking of B minus or better. Also note that the ranking system used for these tech stocks may differ from the rankings we use to rate the dividend growth stocks because many stocks, tech stocks, do not pay dividends. Therefore, in this ranking, we ignore the criteria that involves dividend growth, dividend payout ratio, etc. New to list this week are Accenture, ServiceNow, and Marvel Technology. The top four this week are Adobe, Accenture, Workday, and Microsoft. We are trying other strategies too using real stock portfolios. Besides this dividend growth strategy, we are also running the following portfolios. A high yield, a dividend paying stock portfolio. This is the one that's surprising me the most. This high yield portfolio currently has a 4.37% yield and kind of shockingly is beating the S&P 500. I would have thought that a high yield portfolio would not produce enough capital gains to beat the market, but so far it has. Let me know if you want any more videos, or let me know if you want any videos about this portfolio. It was started in August of last year, but the average investment in the portfolio has an annualized return of 40% versus 29.6%, excuse me, 33.2%. Oh wait, I screwed up the numbers. It was started in August of last year, but the average investment in the portfolio has an annualized return of 43.4%, versus 33.2% for the S&P 500. The other numbers I mentioned were from last week's video. I forgot to update them. Anyway, obviously those numbers will come down and histor because historically stocks average only 10% per year. We also have a portfolio consisting of stocks with the best competitive advantages, also called moats. Note that all stocks are eligible for that portfolio, both dividend paying stocks and non-dividend paying stocks. So in the comments, let me know if you have any questions or if you want to know more about our other portfolios. Also, let me know what other kind of investing videos you'd like to see. And finally, here are the places you can reach me, YouTube, obviously, as well as X and LinkedIn and my website, beatsastockmarket.com. We'll talk to you next week.